This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. When a father and his two sons set out for a fun day of downhill skiing, the furthest thing from their minds is getting lost in a blinding snowstorm. But before the last run of the day, the father and his youngest son lose their way in an icy wilderness. Taking refuge in a tiny cave, military search teams sent out to find them have no idea where to look. Hey! Believing he must find a way out of their frozen hell, this father faces an agonizing dilemma. Stay with his son and risk both of them dying in a freezing hell, or leave him to search for help. It's a choice no parent should ever have to make in I Shouldn't Be Alive. Kaya, a popular ski resort in northwest Turkey. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Couillard is looking forward to a day of skiing with his two sons. Mark is 12 years old. I hope we have a lot of snowball fights. Matthew is just 10. I thought, well, what a great time for uh, my sons and I to get some bonding time. This is a rare break from his demanding job in the U.S. Air Force. Stationed in the Turkish capital Ankara, Mike is part of Operation Provide Comfort, responsible for protecting the Kurds of northern Iraq since the first Gulf War. It's a three-hour drive by bus to the ski slopes. The route winds north through the desolate countryside from Ankara to the remote resort of Kartalkaya. A few families from the airbase have joined Mike and the boys on the trip. Kartal Kaya is not a real big mountain. It's about 6,000 feet. We've been there once, and we hadn't really totally explored the mountain, but it was uh, you know, certainly a good place for us to go as a family. They haven't been on the slopes for over a year, but it doesn't take long before Mike and the boys are back in the swing of things. Mark's always been the, you know, a very curious one and very adventurous. Matthew's got a quiet strength and a uh, heart of gold, and he just cares about people. After a great morning on the lower slopes, they're pretty tired, but Matt is bursting with confidence and wants to tackle some harder runs. This means taking three different lifts to the summit. Matthew and I were together, and Mark and his friends going to go on their own for a while. He said that him and Matt were going to ski together, and that was the last time I saw him that day. As the chairlift carries them towards the summit, the weather begins to turn. We've been skiing in Colorado where you have a nice sunny day and then you see these uh, wispy clouds rolling around the top of the mountain and that's kind of what it was starting to look like. But this isn't Colorado. Without warning, a solid bank of fog is rolling in from the Black Sea. Locals call it the Mista. When this combines with snow, the sky and land appear as one. It's called a whiteout. Finding your way in these conditions is almost impossible. By the time they reach the top, the weather is much worse. It's like being on another planet. The ski run is no longer visible. Mike decides to stay close to the ski lift. It's a good plan, but the weather keeps getting worse. It just was getting harder and harder to keep sight of the trail. Almost immediately, Mike's plan falls apart. We've lost the lift. I think it's over there. We decided, uh, okay, well, let's just stop and let's uh, sidestep up the hill to get in that direction. Rather than continuing down the mountain, Mike decides to play it safe and backtrack up the slope until they find the lift. I kept thinking that we would get to the top of the hill, we'd look down and see the resort, the hotel, the wide open expanse. We just found another hill up, up in front of us. Dad, we're so lost. Sidestepping up the hill is getting them nowhere. Reluctantly, Mike makes the decision to turn around and continue back downhill. 
I'm driven by the clock at this point. By now, it's between 3.30 and 4, and it's already starting to look like the sun's going down and it's getting, getting on towards twilight. Completely disoriented, Mike has led his son around to the far side of the mountain. They're skiing away from the resort and out into a vast icy wilderness. Dad, you okay? It's okay. I'm good. At the resort, the bus to Ankara is ready to leave. But Mark hasn't seen his dad or brother since they left for the summit. When I got to the bus, my brother and dad weren't there. So I figure, you know, the bus will have to wait a minute, but they'll show up. But Mike and Matthew are nowhere near the bus. Come on, Matt. Pick it up. Let's go. Matthew and his dad have trudged miles by now. Ten-year-old Matthew is cold and totally exhausted. We were in a complete whiteout and the temperature was dropping by the minute. And I just couldn't believe the situation I'd gotten myself into. It was like one moment we were, we were having a nice time skiing in the sun and then the next we were facing this terrible situation. We're already looking at darkness and, and uh, we're still not anywhere close to being able to connect with this bus. As the last hint of daylight disappears, the temperature plummets. Hypothermia is now a real risk for them. They've got to get out of this blizzard. With no sign of his dad or brother, Mark is on the verge of panic. As the bus drove away, it was pretty much that moment when I knew that something was really wrong and I didn't know if I would see them ever again. Back in Ankara, Mike's wife Mary is waiting at home for her boys to return from their day trip. Hello. Hello, Mary. It's Wanda. Major Wanda Villers, Mike's colleague, has stayed behind at the resort with Mark. This is a phone call she's been putting off for as long as she can. My friend Wanda was on the phone and she said that Mike and Matthew had not come down off the mountain. We've got some guys out there looking right now. I'm concerned. She says there's a blizzard there and that's probably part of the problem and and I don't want to hear that. After seven hours struggling through the snow, Matthew is totally wiped out. He just can't go another step. He's just done, and I can't carry him. I make this decision anyway. Let's stop. Fortunately, Mike has been through survival training, so he knows how to make a shelter. But a night in a raging blizzard with his 10-year-old son is a different thing altogether. What comes from the back of my mind, like a ton of bricks, uh, is the full weight of the situation. Hey, we're, we're going to be out here, and uh, now we're in, in a survival situation. Despite the weather conditions, employees from the resort start searching for Mike and Matthew. Mark is desperate for any news. As I was looking out the window, kind of hoping I would see them coming down the mountain, I could hear the loudspeakers playing. Turkish pop music on all the ski runs, hoping that my dad and brother would hear it and find, uh, find the hotel. But Mike and Matthew have now strayed so far from the resort, they hear nothing. As day breaks on the Turkish capital, Ankara, Mary wakes to a nightmare. Her husband and 10-year-old son are missing on a mountain. Until now, she's kept the truth from her little girl, Marissa. Where is that? Come and sit down here. It's morning now, and the phone hasn't rung in the middle of the night. So I have to tell her. A group from the Special Forces Unit from Mike's Air Base swing into action. This time, their job is not to protect the Kurds, but to look for one of their own. Turkish troops, with their knowledge of the local terrain, join the American military operation. Mike's commanding officer, Colonel Fitzgerald, sets up a temporary headquarters on the mountain.
Hello? Mary, it's Ed Fitzgerald here. I just wanted to update you on the situation. Mike's colonel lets me know that the search has already started, that people are actually looking for them. He's going to coordinate the search from the uh, lodge there at the ski resort. After a night exposed in the open, Mike is desperate to find better protection for Matthew. In the daylight, I was able to see there was like uh, an opening in the rock. So I slid down the hill and I went around to the other side and, and sure enough, it was like a godsend. Amazingly, they've spent the night only a few feet away from a small cave. There's no way he can expect Matthew to continue in the blizzard. He's still too wiped out. The cave gives them an opportunity to follow a basic rule of survival. When you're lost, stay put and wait for rescue. Finally able to catch their breaths, their gnawing hunger pangs feel more urgent. But all they've got are five pieces of candy Mike finds in his pocket. The sugar in the candy is quickly absorbed into their bloodstream. It gives them a quick rush of energy, but it's pretty short-lived and almost useless to their bodies. It wasn't enough to satisfy our hunger, but it was a nice and pleasant to at least have some kind of taste. The candy is only a minor distraction from their discomfort. That's wet, huh? Take mine. Mike begins to worry about the state of Matt's clothes. They've really soaked up a lot of water, and I'm concerned that, you know, this water now is going to freeze, and so we got to get them out of this. Dad, you know what? I don't think I can ski today. That's okay. Because we're staying here. First rule of survival, give people a chance to find us. If there's going to be any chance of a rescue, Mike's got to mark their location. But he hasn't got much to work with. I just took my skis and planted them as a big X, the international distress signal for skiers. I just hoped that there would be people come up and see those. And if they saw the skis, then they would be able to find us. Mike and Matthew have been exposed to sub-zero temperatures for 24 hours. The cave protects them from the freezing wind and snow, but little else. Mike's hands are turning white and waxy. He recognizes these as early signs of frostbite. If he's in trouble, then Matthew could be too. These boots were not doing a good job of keeping our feet warm, so having looked at my own hands and seen the condition I was in, I decided, you know, maybe I ought to investigate Matthew's feet. Dad, I can't get my toes. That's wet. The realization was he was starting to experience some of the first stages of frostbite there on his feet, too. We'll get your toes. Get the circulation going. I'm not going to put your boots back on. Here, give me your scarf. Even in the cave, it's cold enough for water to freeze. Hypothermia and frostbite are constant threats. Here we are in this tiny cave, this little crack in the mountain, in a raging blizzard. And we're both in the early stages of frostbite. No, it's not so bad. If we didn't get help, we were just going to die on this mountain. After a day holed up in a cave, Mike and Matthew face a second night on the mountain. They've had no food or water for over 30 hours. Desperate for a drink, they begin to eat snow. But doing this puts their exhausted bodies under more stress. Melting the snow cools Matt's mouth and his body has to work harder to replace this lost heat, burning up precious energy reserves that Matt needs to fight off the bitter cold. Mike knows the risks. I don't eat anymore. That's enough. What was that? Just a small animal, nothing to worry about. To keep Matt from freaking out, Mike tries to distract him. Remember when we were in the Mediterranean? All that Italian food? And you and Mark, you just wanted to eat burgers. 
Yeah. Just anything to get his mind off this bloody, crazy situation that we're in. Dad, I thought they would have come for us by now. Yeah. I'm sure they'll find us tomorrow. The ground search is called off until morning. I'm getting phone calls once a day, but that just wasn't enough. No news yet, honey. There's just too many hours where we didn't know what was going on, and it just seems like all the little hopes just could keep getting put out. After 48 hours without food, hunger pangs are ripping through Matt's gut. He's finding them impossible to ignore. Dad, I'm real hungry. It's our last one. Do you hear that? What? Helicopter. Come on, Dad. Please go. They can see us. All of a sudden, the shot of adrenaline took over, and I, all action again, scrambled outside, and uh, to my amazement, this helicopter just literally seemed like it was flying out of the mist. But as suddenly as it appeared, it was gone. And it was almost a hopeless case. I just was too far down into this little valley to be seen. Mike now has to go back and face his son with the devastating news. Dad, I can't get my boot on. It's so fit. I'll help you. His words offer a small glimmer of hope in an otherwise unbearable situation. On the third day of Mike and Matt's disappearance, Mark returns home from the mountain. At least now, his mother has one son safely at her side. He was able to spend time with his sister, which was good, because he could distract her. You know, I was still hopeful that they would turn up at any moment, just come marching in all uh, snow-covered. Up on the mountain, Mike and Matthew's physical condition is going downhill fast. How's your feet? I can't feel them. About every 30 minutes to an hour, I would take his feet and put them on my belly and let the core body temperature warm him up. It was also an opportunity to periodically check and see how his feet were doing. And I could see that they were still getting worse. I'm going to take your boot, OK? Mike acknowledges the terrible truth. The frostbite means Matt is never going to walk out of here. His boots are of no use to him anymore. Making the best of a hopeless situation, Mike uses the boot to carry water from the stream he has found back to Matt. Using the aluminum ski pole, he makes a straw for Matthew, allowing him to drink more easily. It's the most water he has had since they became lost, much needed if he is to stay alive. The search is gathering momentum. Forty Turkish commandos now join the U.S. Green Berets, but what they don't realize is that all their efforts are focused on a search that's on the wrong side of the mountain. That's the fourth day, and all of a sudden we heard this helicopter sound. Helicopter. I didn't have much time to get outside. I didn't even have time to put my boots on. Hey! Hey! It came seemingly out of nowhere. I could even see the American flag painted on the side. It just flew right over the top of us and was gone. It never made two passes. Mike has a chilling realization. 
the helicopter isn't flying in a search pattern. It must be on the way to a search grid somewhere else. They're looking in the wrong place. My hopes took a plunge into despair. They didn't see us. It was so close. He practically flew over top of us. They're never going to find us, Dad. Matt, listen. There's a ridge I'm going to try and get to the top of. Maybe see a way out. What's the point? Matt, we got to stay positive. Matt, step out of it! No, Dad! No! We're never going to get out of here! We're going to die here! Matt can no longer walk, and Mike won't leave him alone. But if he does nothing, they're going to die, hidden from sight, on the side of a Turkish mountain. Mike and Matthew have now been lost in the wilderness for five days. Mike is seriously concerned for his son's life. He needs to make their position more visible. He thinks the ridge he spotted the day before could be their only hope. I knew if I was to be seen, I needed to get up above where we were. You know, if I could climb up on top of that ridge, I figured it'd be a, a lot easier to be spotted. Mike's had nothing to eat for days. He's all out of energy, and this is a tough climb. He puts his all into it, but in his weakened state, it's just too much for him. Back in Ankara, things are looking bleak. Colonel Fitzgerald calls with the news that the high-tech Black Hawk helicopters are being withdrawn from the search. But we still have the Hueys, right? It's a harsh acknowledgement that there is now little hope of finding Mike and Matthew alive. Okay. They're going to um, change the type of helicopter that they're going to have out, and it's just going to map out the area where they think they are so that they can go back and find their bodies in the spring. Mike and Matt aren't dead yet, but with each passing day, their condition continues to deteriorate. For Mike, his physical suffering is nothing compared to his emotional turmoil. I'd left a family behind without a father. I just couldn't face the reality of that. I found myself looking at Matthew as he lay there sleeping, and um, he just looked so peaceful, almost like a little angel as he lay there. I became aware of just how fragile he was, and um, I don't know what I'd do if I had to go back and face Mary without uh, Matthew with me. Even the most optimistic members of the search party begin to fear the worst. Some now view this operation as a body recovery mission. We'd been missing for about a week now. I was beginning to wonder if they'd ever find us. Remaining positive for the sake of his son is mentally exhausting. But there's no way Mike's going to let his true feelings show. They didn't come. When we get out of here, I'm going to buy you the, the biggest hamburger you've ever seen. A flask of fries. And a bucket of Coke. You know what, Dad? Really? What I want is a pizza. To Mike's growing concern, Matt is spending more and more time asleep. After six days without food, Matt's stomach is empty. He's out of fuel, and because his 10-year-old body has less energy reserves than an adult, his blood sugar levels plummet. His brain, detecting this dangerous situation, triggers sleep to try and conserve his dwindling energy. Mike and Matthew's disappearance has become a major international news story. Colonel Fitzgerald calls a press conference in the resort hotel, but it's not looking good. If uh, we do not find any more information uh, in the next 24 to 36 hours, then we may consider uh, stopping the search and assume for this particular location 
that the bodies are underneath the snow. I'm just infuriated at that thought because I just don't think they're gone. I wanted to be positive the whole time and really was until about that point and I started to run scenarios through my head what would what would I do without my dad what would I do without my brother what would life be like Mike continues with his daily vigil watching over Matt but despite his best efforts Matt's frostbite is getting worse I was not pleased with what I saw it was not good. As careful as I was being, it's still not enough. Can you feel that? No, I can't feel anything. A helicopter! Dad! It sounds like a Huey. It's not worth it, son. It's too far away. That was, to me, a sign that they'd scaled down the search, but um, I didn't want to even relay that information to Matt. Wanda pays a visit to Mary, but it's not a social call. She says that they're thinking of sending Mark and Maurice and I back to the States. To be near family. This is my family, Wanda. I know that. But waiting in the U.S., it might be easier, you know? I'm adamant that I'm not going. <laughs> Despite Mike's efforts, Matthew's thoughts wander to a very dark place. Dad? Huh? Will I still be able to kick a ball? Your foot's gonna be fine, son. I've got another question. Go on. What's it like to, you know, to die? I didn't want him going there. You're not gonna die. But I sort of had to deal with that. I felt if this gets worse and worse and worse and we look at death, I need to prepare him for that. On the seventh day, even though Mike is weak from the lack of food and the frigid temperatures, he tries again to climb the ridge. Surely the ski resort must lie somewhere on the other side. It's his one hope and perhaps the difference between living and dying. We're hearing helicopter sounds for a long time. They've come by and they've flown directly overhead, but primarily they're over in this one area. Mike doesn't realize that they have traveled further than anyone imagined possible. They are miles away from the resort. I've tried it several times, and it seemed every time I just could not get up on top of this ridge. Mike is furious with himself. How could he have brought his youngest son to this desperate situation? After seven days, I began to wonder, well, how long will I even have the use of these hands? I decided to start writing a note to my family. It'd sure be nice to tell the people I love, uh, like my wife and family, you know, how I feel about them. Do you want me to write anything from you? Okay. Matthew has just got that tender heart. Tell Marissa, I wish I hadn't followed her so much. He's a real quiet kid, but he's deep too, and that love is coming out in, in his words. Tell Mom she's a good cook. You know what? Just tell them I love them. Leave it. We don't have to do it today. What do you 
doing? I thought maybe you could warm my feet. In a last-ditch effort, the Turkish government deploys 500 troops on the mountain for a one-day search. It's Mike and Matt's last chance of being found. I just can't believe the amount of people involved in searching for them. And on the other hand, I'm worried if they think they're just looking for bodies. And it's hard to keep being hopeful. After yesterday's spiral into despair, Mike wakes determined to take action. Fighting off the urge to sleep, he decides to tackle the ridge one more time. He forces his frostbitten feet into his boots. Every time I put those boots back on, I was taking some already frostbitten tissue and aggravating it and, and doing damage. One look at his son is all it takes to spur him on. The ridge looms high above Mike, taunting him. I knew that um, at some point the search is going to be called off. You know, I'd already tried several times, but maybe I can try it one more time. He's convinced if he succeeds, he'll be high enough to orientate himself. Ignoring the pain, he pushes himself on. I don't know why I was successful, but this time I was able to get up. I got up on this plateau and was able to see a panorama. But the ski resort that he'd hoped to see is not there. Instead, off in the distance lie some cabins Mike now faces an agonizing dilemma. What if you go to these cabins and you get there and there's nobody there and now you're in a worse position? Well, what if you don't go? What if you just stay here and die? The only way to decide this is to, to put this to Matthew and, and, uh, and see how he's with this. I sort of calculated at, at some point I'm going to Maybe go for help. That time came. It was kind of a now or nothing thing. Matthew, listen, I've seen some cabins I think I can get to. I'm just not sure I can leave you behind. You know what, Dad? If we stay here, they'll just be finding our bodies. I'm going to leave you my coat, okay? Don't try and leave the cave. I'll be back before nightfall. Hardest decision I've ever made to leave this this uh, child of mine behind. I swore I'd never do that. It's tearing my heart out. Even knowing that it was the logical best thing to do. The decision to leave fires Mike with new determination. Adrenaline courses through his veins, forcing him forward. Just the physical act of moving myself down this trail was carrying me along mentally as well. But after days without food, Mike is running on empty. To provide energy for his physical exertion, his body is literally eating away at its own muscles. Even so, Mike is using up these last energy reserves far quicker than his body can supply more. So he finds he must stop often to give his body time to recharge. 
but nothing is going to stop Mike pushing on to the cabins. In my mind's eye, it was a resort. That if I could just get there, there would be people there waiting for me to send help back to my son. After two hours of exhausting skiing, Mike is close to collapse. But he is desperate, so he keeps on searching. I'm looking for telephone lines, power lines, signs that there really are people there. I don't see smoke coming out of the chimneys. I don't see any snowmobiles. All I see is animal tracks. It's pretty obvious that there's nobody there. Mike decides to head for the two largest cabins to see what's inside. He thinks if he can start a fire, the smoke will be a sure sign to rescuers that there is someone at the abandoned village. There was a little stove. Oddly enough, it was stoked and ready to go. Mike finds a box of matches nearby. But inside, there's only one match. I was like, this is my one chance. I only get one. He can't bear to strike it yet. Instead, he goes to another cabin to see what else he can find. He gets lucky and discovers a can of kerosene. I went back, got ready to strike my one match. Every strike I took, it was fizzling and it was not igniting. And I, when I finally wore out all the sulfur on that match, it was like my hopes just fizzled. Mike has no way of attracting attention. He's stranded in a deserted village miles from his son, and it's getting close to nightfall. He promised Matt that he'd be back before dark, but he's physically exhausted and knows he'd never make it. I'm tortured by the thought of my son alone in this cave. My worst fears is he's, uh, you know, maybe he's just lost it. I was in just a torment, just realizing that he was uh, in a worse place than me. After spending the night in the cabin, Mike's frozen feet have begun to thaw. I woke up in such excruciating pain, and I imagine what it must be like to be burned. My feet had expanded to a third bigger. Inside Mike's foot, the bitter cold froze the fluid in his cells, causing the cell walls to rip apart. But as his feet thaw, the cellular fluid leaks out of the torn cells into the tissue. It's agony. I could tell that there's no way I could physically get these boots back on. I felt like a, a helpless child. Faced with this painful reality, Mike's resolve to make the trip back up the mountain is shattered. Now there's no way I'm going to get back up to, uh, to where Matthew is. There's no way I can get back and uh, I can't take care of him anymore. The rescue teams are disbanding. Just 15 members of the U.S. Special Forces will remain on the mountain. Colonel Fitzgerald goes to see Mary. They want to look at the options again, Mary. Colonel Fitzgerald has come over to the house, and he's talking about, well, maybe they skied over a ridge and didn't even realize in the dark. It's kind of snow coverage. He's got pictures of all this tons and tons of snow, and you can't even tell trees are trees, and, of course, it is pretty... Um, pretty bad looking. Mike wouldn't leave Matt. They're waiting for us to find them. Yes, but the thing is, I believe they're still alive. I don't know, I just feel like I should have a sense that if they're gone, that I would know it. Mike spends another agonizing night in the cabin, miles away from his young son. I drifted off to sleep with this prayer on my lips, like, God, just help us, because it doesn't seem like anything I've done is getting it done.
separated from his son, Mike's isolation is just unbearable. But he does his best to keep focused and do what it takes to stay alive. I'd run out of water. I grabbed a couple of pots and pans and crawled my way to the front door to just scoop some snow off the steps. A group of lumberjacks are returning to work, having left before the bad weather. The moment they set eyes on Mike, they know he's the American lieutenant whose face has been all over the news. The man everyone has given up for dead. It's like everything's going in slow motion. Things can't happen quick enough. And I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking, come on, come on, let's get on with it. You know, you got to help me. The men quickly dispatch a search party to go and look for Matthew. Mike faces a desperate wait for news of his son. I'm going nuts here, you know. I don't even know if he's alive anymore. Ah! Following Mike's directions, the rescuers race to the cave, but they have no idea what to expect when they get there. It's a sea of humanity. People are just flooding around this little cabin. And I can see the sea of people parting. I remember them just bringing me in, and uh, I saw my dad. And they're carrying this little package that was my son. Hi, Dad. He was looking back up to me with this glossy look. Again, I lost it and started to weep. They put Matthew on my lap, and I'm just a ball of tears. I can't describe the emotion that's just coursing through my veins at this point because, uh, you know, we've, we've been through hell, and now we're, we're out. The phone rings, and it's Wanda again. She says that they found him and that they're okay. Mike and Matthew are both suffering from dehydration, starvation, hypothermia, and frostbite. But they're lucky. Amazingly, it's only Matthew who suffers a loss. He has to part with half of one toe and the tip of another. After three months in hospital, both Mike and Matthew make a full recovery. And after a long break, they even brave the ski slopes again. Now retired from the Air Force, Mike misses flying, so he's building a light aircraft that one day he'll pilot. Matthew's interests lie far closer to the ground. He's now a drummer in a heavy metal band. <laughs> 